I am very glad that you are here. Very glad because all across this country, church people are not in church. The reason, this is the first Sunday after Thanksgiving. <laughs> this is the lowest church attendance of any Sunday in the year. Now I can't see, but if it was just one of y'all out there, I'm thankful. Amen. At first, when I was asked to preach on this Sunday, I wondered, how much am I loved? <laughs> but then I realized, brother, it doesn't matter. Every word of worship Come on. in one accord. Yeah. So I said, oh yes, absolutely, I'll be there. Every praise was the was the uh, title, is the title, and you absolutely right, Brother David? Come on, Reverend. Because I hear that song, and I just, I just, I just feel good. Yes. And I said, this church needs to be a part of what I'm feeling here. So church, I want to I wanna speak to you about this thing called praise. All right. There is a, uh, the first line of a very sacred Jewish prayer begins, Baruch Atah Adonai. Praised are you, the eternal one, our God. That's what that means. Praised are you, the eternal one, our God. Now, back in the ancient age of the 80s, <laughs> that's when televangelism was going on. Pat Robinson, Falwell, Tammy and Jim, Paul Crouch. And there was a program called Praise the Lord, PTL. A rabbi friend of mine said to me, Gerald, they stole our prayer. <laughs> now he said that tongue in cheek, church. But the meaning, I think, went a little bit further than just that little joke that he said. Because sometimes we get all caught up in what's ours and we forget that what we're talking about is bigger than us, right. Pastor David. Absolutely. So often when you say praise, people say, oh, that's what they do. That, that's not what we do. When if you read the early church, Read the scriptures of the early church. You hear all kinds of dancing, singing, hands in the air. Even if you fast forward to the Reformation, my biblical scholars out there, <laughs> when Martin Luther changed everything and there became a Protestant versus a Catholic, even in that, the people could not read the people could only sing when they heard the words preached and they sung. So we hear the songs that were written back then were songs that the people heard from the pulpit and they put words to music. There has always been expression of praise but some kind of way, we got the feeling that praise is something you just don't exhibit. Excuse me. <laughs> we have forgotten we have a body. Yes, we have a wonderful mind. We have a heart that animates our mind. But have we become so bifurcated that we have forgotten all about the appendages? <laughs> if we feel good, church. It's appropriate to sway, tap, clap, 
wave? Because that's who we are. If we are of one accord, all of us, mind, heart, body, it's okay to express it. We have gotten away from the things that brought us thus far. But church, there's some things that we need to discover here. First of all, let's break it down. All praise is, is thank you. Grateful. Thankfulness. Thank you. And we're saying thank you as the ancient text said to the eternal one our God. Praised are you. The eternal one our God. Because there was some things to be thankful for. Pastor David asked beautifully for folks just to say some things they're thankful for. That's where praise comes from. So if you hear a speaker who comes to an audience, the first thing the speaker will say is, thank you for inviting me, I'm glad to be here. If you read a book, the first page you see is acknowledgments. Well, thank you for helping me. I thank my wife for putting up with me during these times. Or a husband. If you are invited to a radio program, the people will say thank you for coming and most people say thank you for having me. Now of course I have an issue about having. I would like people to say thank you for inviting me or I'm delighted to be here. I don't like thank you for having me. What does that mean, having me? Having me here? But whatever. <laughs> I'm grateful. That's what the person's saying. The person is saying, I'm thankful. Now, church, here is our issue with praise. We already discovered that we have become separate from our bodies, you know, and now, you know, but you know what? You can't stay away. You know you can't. So do you know that the yoga studios are full of people who are trying to get back in touch with their bodies, right? Go to a yoga studio and watch. All those folks trying to get that thing together. Go see how people work out. They work out in, at the wire, wherever they work out, and they're trying to get back in touch with their bodies to move the bodies in sync with how they're feeling, right? All of that is that, how come we can't do that here in church? There's nothing wrong with moving in church, church. Now, I know I'm talking to the 1130, <laughs> this 1130 bunch. I know that, I know that, I know that. But sometimes, so, sometimes even the 1130 bunch would be self-conscious. Yeah. No, self-conscious has to do with you. This is about praise. Praised are you, the eternal one, our God. That's where we are. So here, here's a lesson here. This theologian, who, who is taking track of things and looking at trends, made a, a, a startling announcement. This, this theologian said, there are more Pentecostals in the world than there are people in the United States. The person said, this is a phenomenon that is spreading throughout the world. <laughs> this Pentecostal and what that means to people is moving faster than anything they've seen before all over the world. Now I got issues with theologically, theological issues with Pentecostalism. There are some things that I say, well that's not really where I believe. But there's some things the Pentecostals got it. They understand it. They understand one thing about praise. There is, there are moments when we look and say, well, maybe I need to share some of the things that are going on, right? So that is the freedom that we have to look and see, well, theologically, there may be some issues, but I think you got it right when you're talking about praise. So we can adopt that. That's called cross-fertilization. <laughs> That's synergy. Because we can make something happen when we take something with us and say, okay, let's move this on up. So we can sing hallelujah to our God. That's biblical, by the way. That's in the scripture. 
<laughs> so we can sing that, we can feel that, we can express that. It's okay to move beyond the places that we are comfortable. I had an experience once about moving beyond and, and praise, a couple of experiences I would like to share with you. One happened when, when I was a seminarian, my first year in seminary in Pittsburgh. And that was my first time away from Oklahoma. And I was uh, uh, in the dorm during Thanksgiving. And you know, that's kind of sad. <laughs> you know, it's kind of sad you're there, I'm away from home. I'm but one of my professors who, who had a lot to do with me getting to Pittsburgh, David Buttrick, homiletics professor, invited me to his home during Thanksgiving to worship, not worship, but to eat with his family. And also present was going to be his father, the famous George Arthur Buttrick. His father was the editor for the Interpreter's Bible, that series of commentaries, and you may see them, hardbound books that are they're fabulous. They look at commentaries on each other, the books of the Bible. George Arthur Buttrick was the editor for that, and also a noted biblical scholar and professor. So he was going to be there. He's in his later years. He was in his later years, and he was spending Thanksgiving with his son and his son's family. Well, Professor Buttrick invited me and some other seminarians, and we trudged on over to the house, and it was beautifully decorated, beautifully set, and there was George Arthur Buttrick majestically sitting in a large chair with people around him. And I was a, a callow youth, Pastor David, who didn't know too much about something, but I thought I had a right to be there, so I edged on over. And I edged on over a little closer, and finally I was next to the famous Dr. George Arthur Buttrick. And, and I asked him a question that, that was forgettable, you know. Do you believe the Lord? You know, something. <laughs> So, something that was silly, but you know, I asked him the question and, and he, he listened to me and he gave a thoughtful response. And then he turned back to me and he said, do you like basketball? And, and you know, I, I said, yes, yes, I like basketball. He says, do you know Dr. J? Have you heard of him? And of course, you know, Dr. J? Plays for the Philadelphia 76ers? Yeah, I know Dr. J. So he then began church a poetic rhapsody about the grace of Dr. J. Here is this noted biblical scholar getting off talking about Dr. J and flying through the air and his afro flapping and... <laughs> and I was, I was listening to him because he was in it. He was in it, he was praising Dr. J. And, I, and at first, because I'm, you know, I'm Calo youth, I'm the only African American there, I thought, now this, now this man is not taking me seriously. He could have responded to me as a student, as a seminarian, as a budding theologian, but instead, he brings in basketball. And at first, I got kind of like put off, you know, like, well, listen, they're talking about that. But then, he didn't stop talking about Dr. J. And I realized, this is not about me. This is about him. He is released at this point. He's not being George Arthur Buttrick, famous biblical scholar. He's being himself. And because he was praising like that, people stopped asking him questions. <laughs> he, he praised Dr. J, but the way he was praising church, it was beautiful. It was poetic. And I learned something there later. Because at first I was a little put off, but I thought about it later and I learned what he was doing. So often we want to be who we are. We want to speak from our hearts, but we are contained in this thing called conformity. And we feel like, oh, maybe people will look at me. And we get self-conscious. Self-conscious is not you. That's you looking at you, thinking others are looking at you the way you're looking at you. <laughs> Now that has nothing to do with the Lord. <laughs> that has nothing to do with good God. That's, fun. That's just stuff. But church, I learned something when I went to hear 
George Arthur Buttrick. There's something else I learned too. I went to this, to this church, and this church was a, a Baptist church. Now, I grew up in High Baptist Church, but they, you know, High Baptist. Now, now High Baptist Church, we, we, we didn't do too much jumping up and pray. There, there might be a hand that goes up now and then. It wasn't why. And there might be an amen from the deacons. The deacons may say amen, but nobody got happy. <laughs> oh, no. But you know, we would, as kids, we would go down to the Pentecostal church in the evening time. And we would stand outside as kids, stand outside the door because they had it going on. The tambourines, the tambourines were moving and folks were swinging and singing and the organ, the organ was playing. Ooh, no, no, no. Well. <laughs> So we were out there, we were out there just jamming. We were jamming, we were jamming because, but we didn't go in. Cause you know, we were high Baptists. <laughs> so, so, so I, 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 I consequently had one idea of what, it, of what a high Baptist does. And I went to this Baptist church because the minister had invited me. He also was in seminary. And he had invited me to his church. Well, I sat down and I saw folks jumping up Folks were starting to shout, and they walked up and down the aisles. And of course, as a callow youth from Oklahoma, I was checking all this out. I was looking, and you know. And so this one woman went up the aisle, came back now, and hit me right upside the head. <laughs> Pow! See, the, the Lord struck her, and she, the spirit moved. She, but I think she knew I was a visitor. <laughs> so she wanted to awaken the spirit within me. So I learned something. Once again, you get outside yourself, you begin to learn about these things and you begin to understand how the Spirit moves you even, right? So there I was then in a place that said, I need to understand. I need to be able to touch this thing inside of me. And so I began to do those kinds of things, Brother David, that have to do with prayer. Because prayer will put you on your knees and just open your mouth and start talking. You, you say, I don't know, really know how to pray. Just, just open your mouth. Get on, get on your knees, though. See, I'm, I'm old school. <laughs> See, I'm going to tell you later, if you're on your knees, you have humbled yourself. If you have humbled yourself, you can listen a little better. Because now you don't care who's looking. You're on your knees and you are speaking the truth from your heart. And once you start opening your mouth and speaking the truth, things start happening to you. And those things happen to me, thank God. Thank God. Because see, if I did not, then you could see right through me. You could see the fake. But I don't fake, church. It's too real to fake. And I'm afraid to fake. <laughs> I don't play. You don't play with the Lord. It's for real. So I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you about how it is that you praise. Some people understand that there is a story. They have a story about where they were and where they are now. And that story has to do with oppression. And oppression for a person my age, with the skin I have and the gender that I tote around, there was oppression everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. But you still had people in front of you saying, come on, don't, no, don't pay attention, keep moving. You, you, you must not stop, don't slide, come on, stay on the road. And those people go all the way back, of course, our parents, but there were Sunday school teachers. There were grade school teachers. There were people who were coaches. There were people who were all around you, angels, Lord have mercy, who were sent to get, to get you oriented, to orient yourself around oppressive environment. How can you make it through the oppression? Well, if we read the book of Exodus, 
We understand this is not the first time there have been people sent to guide us through passages. And once we get through those passages, we are in a place that is promised, right? That's liberation. So from oppression to liberation, but in between church, there's the wilderness. And in that wilderness, sometimes you want to go back to oppression. You say, oh, at least I had this. At least this was going on. But church, you can't stop. You can't stop. You have to keep moving because there is a promised land. Now, we know the last message Dr. King gave. He said, I may not get there with you, but believe you me, there, you will get to the promised land. There is a place of liberation. So church, this is what I was taught then. I, was, I learned how to speak the truth to power. I learned how to go through the wilderness and get slapped down, but get right back up. Mm -hmm. yeah. I learned that when you do that, there is an automatic thank you. Yes. It comes out. You can't help it. Once you are grateful, you can't help saying thank you. Yes. It's an automatic kind of thing. Yes. My son, my son, my son. Don't get me started on my son, but I, I love my son. And my son is a wonderful young man. And sometimes I do these things, church, because some of you all know I can't see. But, you know, some people don't because I don't, I don't carry my stick, for instance. My wife says, use your stick. I, I don't. <laughs> so... One of the things that I do, though, I, I, I test myself. I see, well, okay, you can't see, but can you make it? And I push myself to do little things. Now, one of the little things that I do is that I take out the trash and I bring it back in. But I do it at night. Now, why would you do it at night? I can't see in the daytime either. I might as well do it at night. So, so I went out to bring it back in and it wasn't where it was supposed to be. I have been disoriented in these escapades that I do. <laughs> and sometimes it's not pretty to see the blind man walking up and down the street <laughs> trying to find his driveway, right? <laughs> so I walked a little bit, still couldn't find it. I went back inside the house. I went straight to my son. I said, son, I need your help. He said, okay. As he started putting his clothes on, he said, uh, what, you want, what you want me to do? I said, uh, your daddy lost the trash cans. <laughs> <laughs> so he went out, and he's a beautiful young man. He said he kept, he kept talking to me to make sure I was close, and he guided me to the place, and then he said, it's to your left, to your right, giving me that independence. I found him. He took one, I took the other. And I said to him, gratefully, I said to him, thank you, buddy. Thank you. He said, no problem, daddy. Now you see, I want to believe that that's all our God, the eternal one, wants us to do. Just to say, thank you. And you know, our God will say, no problem, I'm here. I'm with you. I am. I am, ooh, ooh, stop, Gerald, stop. <laughs> <laughs> I am that I am, you know. I'll be here with you. I'll be here with you. Some folks will say, okay, okay, you blind, you black, I'm not either of those. There's no problem here with me because, you see, I'm privileged. See, I do serve a God of the Most High. And I refuse to say I lack anything. I am all that because the Lord loves me. <laughs> and you know, I hear, I hear that, I understand that, but except that you ain't by yourself. You are part of, what is me? You are part of something. Now, if me includes all my lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender folk, if it includes all the people who are suffering from the oppression of of uh, a wage that is not livable, if it includes all the people who are women who have a glass ceiling they cannot break through, then I'm with you, with your me. 
But if your me is exclusive, excuse me. That's not the way it works. God has called us the wretched of the earth. <laughs> God has called us to be one, to be united. So if you are sitting there in your privileged place saying, I don't identify with any of those things, let me break something down to you. This doctor said, I went to med school to study infectious diseases to stop communicable diseases, those things that make people sick. I went to med school to do that. But that's not what's killing people in the United States of America. It's not infectious diseases. It's not something you can catch. What's killing you are tobacco, alcohol, and diet. And so the doctor said, I got to do something. I can't just continue to watch people die. Now we know what tobacco and alcohol will do in excess to us, but diet is something that we, we play with. Diet is lethal. And I'm talking about one thing, it's called sugar. You didn't think you would hear a preacher up here talking about sugar and talking about praise. But I'm saying if you feel privileged, then you're eating a lot of sugar because you think that's the way it's supposed to be. Eat all you can because I got what it takes to get it. Except that you are oppressed. You are addicted. You need some healing to take you through the wilderness into a liberated mindset. So you put the sugar on the shelf and you move other places. Oh yeah, I'm preaching to you this morning. You see? You see, every praise. See, it's not about you being all content. It's about you have been called to do some work, church. And if you're sick, you can't do the work. What's the work that we've been required to do? Because after you get through working, you want to praise, don't you? You have made it on through. Oh yeah, that's work. There's work to be done. Somewhere in Micah, I think it's the sixth chapter, it's the eighth verse. Some wise person asks, what does the Lord require? What, what am I, of me? What am I supposed to do? I mean, I, you know, I don't really have a feeling about this. What, what am I supposed to do? It's real simple. Three things. This is the translation of Gerald Davis. It's not King James. <laughs> it's not the New Revised Standard Version. It is my translation that I went to seminary so that I could learn uh, Hebrew and Greek. <laughs> And this is my translation of what Micah 6, 8 says. The first thing is do justice. Do justice. Now that's work, church. If you see injustice, that means you got something to do with it, to make it right. Do justice. You can't talk about just me and doing justice. Your mindset is looking out. And you are looking at those who are addicted, oppressed, and saying there is a liberation for you. And you're going through the wilderness, but you're not alone. I'm here with you. So do justice. Second thing is love tenderly. I know some folks say love mercy, but you can't do mercy if you're not tender. Tender has to do with how you approach somebody. If we love, and we know when we love that we are, that's agape, it's unrequited, it's something that I don't want to expect anything coming back, that's agape. But I'm going to be tender with how I love. I'm going to call my neighbor and tell my neighbor of some things that, that, that this neighbor may be willing to do, may not be willing to do, but these are some opportunities. I want to say to somebody who looks like they're hurting, that, you know, I don't know what your story is, but I want you to know that there's a God who loves you. That you are not by yourself and my hand is touching yours because my spirit is touching yours. That we are yoked together. We are united together. We are in this boat together. That's tender. Love tenderly. And then finally, what the Lord requires of us is to walk humbly with your God. What did I say about humble? You see, when you're on your knees, you're not thinking about me, right? Humbly says, God is everything. Praised are you, the eternal one, our God. And so you're humble in that spirit that says, God, I lift you up. You have helped me. You have touched me. You have brought me thus far. I have a story. 
It's an exodus story. It's moving from oppression into liberation. I'm going through a wilderness that is full of the, snow, the, the toils and snares that, that give you cause to pause. But God says, keep going. I'm with you. I have blessed your feet. So they are guided by me. Church, on this day, in this place, every praise is to our God. Yes. Every word of worship yes. is one accord. Yes. Every praise, every, every praise, praise is to our God. Amen. Amen.